Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about Sudan. Our guest is Omiya Mustafa, whose name on social media is Zaira, and she's been telling the story on Instagram of what has been happening in war-torn Sudan. Omiya, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm very so, honored. So I understand you're now in Egypt, but until just recently we're in Sudan. Uh, what, what has happened in Sudan? People around the world are told a lot about Gaza, a lot about Ukraine, but not so much about what's happening in Sudan. Yeah, actually what's happening in Sudan is has triggered one of the world's largest humanitarian crisis in like modern times, as it has been said by many international organizations and uh, news agencies. But for some reason, it's not really gaining any attention and it's very heartbreaking to see. Uh, a war broke out in April 15th in 2023 between the Sudanese Armed Forces and a paramilitary group called the RSF, which is the Rapid Support Forces. And this war and this war has basically displaced 11 million people from their homes and killed. Uh, to this day, the actual number of deaths is not really reported well. It's heavily underreported, but most of uh, social media and most of agencies say it's, it's around from 100K to 300K. But no one can t- say for sure how many people have died due to the underreporting of the war in Sudan. Uh, It's truly catastrophic, especially that nowadays there are a lot of natural disasters, like a lot of floods and heavy rainstorms that's further displacing people and making life harder for the Sudanese people, despite the conflict that they're going through. And what was your personal experience of this when you were in Sudan? Um, Okay, a little introduction. I'm a 21 years old Sudanese girl. I was, I recently graduated. I graduated last year on February, which is two months before the war. Um, It was, I was working towards my dreams. I was interning at my dream job and everything was going well. And then the war broke out. I remember just waking up to the sounds of bombs and airstrikes and mass shootings, not really registering what's going on. Like I couldn't really understand what are those sounds until I checked my phone and I realized that something big is going on. Uh, So we stayed in my house up until five days of like continuous bombing and shelling that's when we realized that we actually need to go. Like whatever is going on is not ending anytime soon and our lives are in danger. This so was we in left. Khartoum? Yeah, yeah, I lived in Khartoum, like the capital city of Sudan where the war started. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, so we left to a nearby state, which is called the Jazeera State. We stayed in the capital of a Jazeera State, which a place many, many displaced people went to. Like, Maybe 3 million people took shelter there after the war started in Khartoum. And honestly, I don't think any Sudanese person came out of their house prepared. Like, I think most of us just took whatever with us and left everything in our homes, thinking we will come back in a week or two. But that never, that never happened. We never came back, unfortunately. Because the violence never stopped. It never stopped. And... Our homes got looted, everything in our houses, even the bathroom seats, like every single piece of furniture or clothing that we had is gone now. And you you know this from neighbors? Yeah, some neighbors who still stuck around up until like three, four months after war, they went in our house and they took pictures of how it looks like now, which is empty, <laughs> void of anything. On, on Instagram, I watched one of your videos and you talk about 
uh, worse horrors than this. You talk about mass graves. What what have you seen? Uh, I personally did not see much as I left only after five or se seven days. I'm not sure, to be honest, uh, after the war broke out. And I, I would say the horrors that I've personally seen were just the aftermath of an attack on a military base. Like I could clearly see, you know, broken vehicles and artillery, and I could see dead soldiers on the ground, you know, their bodies ripped up, ripped open, you know. Those are the things I personally witnessed, but the horrors are non-stopping. The things that come out of Khartoum and in general uh, conflict areas in Sudan, you would better say they're coming out of from like a horror movie or like an apocalypse movie, post-apocalypse. They're truly horrific, the mass graves, the the increase of uh, rapid dogs, you know, like um, like uh, how do you call them, stray dogs yeah. feeding on corpses and becoming violent, and the fact that like birds who are who migrate from Africa to Europe have taken so long this time to go to Europe, and scientists were like, "What's going on?" And then they realized they all come to Khartoum to feed on corpses over there. Like there has been a whole article talking about the climate and the nature, uh, the effects that are, you know, the war the war has left on nature and balance, basically. And what has been the, the contribution of the outside world to this war? What, what foreign nations are, are fueling it? And who, if anyone, is doing anything to help? Honestly, the only time that Sudan was reported when the war started was when embassies were fleeing and when, you know, like the foreigners were fleeing Sudan. That's the only time we saw Sudan on news. We just see, oh, the British diaspora in Sudan are currently getting evacuated from Sudan. Why are they getting evacuated? Nobody says anything. So they're just saying uh, embassy of China have evacuated people, embassy of that, this, that. And then those embassies, they shredded the passports of Sudanese people who were waiting visas before the war. They shredded their passports and left. So I would say since the very beginning, since the get-go, we knew we were setting ourselves up for disappointment if we expected anything from the outer world, you know, aside from fueling the war and fueling the conflict. And then months later we started to see some aid coming from some countries like uh, qatar turkey sending airplanes filled with aids but we did not see anything tangible on ground we don't know what happened to that aid and then the countries that are contributing to the basically fueling the war i would say the number one actor is the united arab of emirates they have been supplying the RSF, the Rapid Support Militia. They've been supplying them with weaponry and setting up camps on the western uh, borders of Sudan with Chad, you know. They've been setting up camps on Chad basically to facilitate aid to the RSF, sending them drones, advanced weaponry, uh, weaponry in general, uh, they airlift the the injured fighters and they treat them in the UAE. And the source of all of this is gold, basically, you know, like gold. They're smuggling gold out of Sudan as well and sending it to the UAE. And another actors, um, we heard that Iran is supplying the army but we also like, it's not spoken about as much as the UAE's involvement, basically. Like I would say the UAE is the main actor from my own understanding as an international relations student. And not, and not so much for the weapons sales as for grabbing gold? Yeah. And this was your, this was your dream job, your internship, uh, your studies was international relations? I graduated from the Faculty of International Relations and Diplomatic Studies, and I was interning at the Higher Academy of Strategic and Security Studies. 
and now you're seeing uh, an absence of international relations. What what has the United Nations Security Council, the United Nations General Assembly, the International Court of Justice, what has any international body done? Nothing tangible. It's just, we condemn, we fear, we are, uh, it's just talks, words, some light sanctions that are not doing anything for anyone. And they are, they always fail to address the actors that are feeling this way, they fail to condemn the UAE, they fail to condemn the RSF for their crimes against humanity, for their genocides, you know. Do you know that in a single city, in a single region in Sudan, the RSF killed over 30,000 people? In an act of ethnic cleansing, they were killing this tribe, which is non-Arab tribe, you know, they are an African indigenous tribe in Western Sudan, in Darfur. They killed every male. They buried them alive and they shot at them. But almost all of these, you know, international organizations, the security councils, they failed to address those things. They failed to address the genocide and the acts of ethnic cleansing that, that are going on. And they failed to mainly address the UAE. Like we don't want to condemn them. We don't want, we're worried. We don't want these, you know, empty words. They do nothing for us. They're just words. So I would say they're doing nothing at all. But of course, the UAE is a close ally and a weapons customer of many other nations, including the one I'm in, the United States, sells lots of weapons to the UAE. Uh, and we've heard nothing about any embargoes, uh, any halt to, to supplying. Can you imagine if that same number of people had been killed in Ukraine? I oh think, my God! I think every every everyone around me would know every detail. I believe we wouldn't hear the end of it. Basically, that's all I'm going to say. It would just be on news, recycled every single day until we die, basically. And I'm not saying I'm not saying this to dehumanize Ukrainians or say that they don't deserve attention. I believe we all are humans and we equally deserve attention and dignity, you know. But I think the world is very, very desensitized to the suffering of Africans. I feel like everyone has this belief in their heads, like whenever they hear about a war in Africa, they're like, well, it's just a bunch of Africans, you know, killing each other. They're savages, you know. We don't care. It's, it's their problems. Let them deal with it. But the reality is, if those people ever step to step down and think about why are there wars in Africa, they would realize that many of the reasons of those wars in Africa can date back to colonialism and neocolonialism and basically proxy wars. They would realize that Africa is so destabilized so the people in the West can benefit from it. So I, I'm not going to say that it's completely like, you know, external forces. I would say our own leaders have sold us as well. And we have our shortcomings. We have corruption. We hate each other. So it's very easy for external forces to like fuel conflicts in Africa. But we cannot deny the, the proxy wars and we cannot deny the external effect on the, on the continent and how much it destabilize Africa. There have been stories even about the war in Ukraine spilling over into Africa, about Ukrainians and Russians fighting each other in Africa. Um, have you seen that? I, I have read news about, so basically Wagner Group has been a close ally with the RSF even before the war. Um, uh, they've been training them, they've been smuggling gold to Russia, you know, like one of the main reason why Russia's economy hasn't collapsed after the war in Ukraine is the gold that's being smuggled from Africa to Russia, basically. And this is getting facilitated through the RSF. Uh, the, the leader of the RSF owns a mountain of gold, basically. And Wagner has been a close ally of theirs. And then after this war started, we just one day we randomly saw a picture of the head of the military forces, the Sudanese military forces with Delinsky. And then 
right afterwards we started to hear that some of the operations in Sudan have been done by Ukrainian special forces who are basically fighting the Russian mercenaries and helping the Sudanese armed forces. But many people say it's a Western propaganda to like uh, uplift Ukraine and you know put them in like a position of power, like a show of power, and that's not actually happening. Yeah. But I don't really know. Like, but we did see a lot of articles basically saying Ukrainian special forces are fighting Wagner in Sudan. But if if the Russian side of it is true, if gold is going to Russia, you'd think that we would hear a lot about it, and we don't. Um, and we hear a lot about about Gaza uh, as we should, and we hear a lot about Ukraine as we should. But there's there is also reporting at least social media on what's happening in Sudan right and we aren't and we aren't seeing it it isn't being shared around in the same way honestly i would say the geopolitical aspect of our war is very complicated because you would see a lot of actors who are usually in uh, uh usually they oppose each other they don't link with each other they don't make alliances, but somehow in the war in Sudan, they are at the same side. So what is going on? Like, for example, Wagner, Russia, like I know Wagner is like an, an independent uh, company, but does it really, I don't know. But you see Wagner and you see the UAE at the same side, smuggling gold from Sudan to Russia and smuggling gold from Sudan to the UAE. And the UAE is a close ally of the USA. The West, basically, and a lot of people like to describe the UAE as a client state of the West in the Middle East. So what what is going on? Like like the more I think about Sudan, the more I realize that it's the the internal aspect of it is so little. It's like maybe twenty percent of difference between Sudanese people, but the eighty percent is just external uh, influence in Sudan and interference. And yes, a lot of Sudanese activists, like myself, I've personally started reporting on Sudan since my second displacement. Uh, after we went to the Jazeera state with Medini, we stayed there for like nine months. And then the war extended to where we are. So I started reporting live on what was going on. And my account suddenly went viral. And do you know why it went viral? Because people thought I was reporting from Gaza. Really? Yeah. They, they, they mixed up the flags and they were like, oh, pray for Gaza, pray for Palestine. I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm from Sudan. I'm not from Gaza and we're going through something similar. And that's when everyone was like, oh, really? There is something in Sudan? It's like, yeah, oh there God. is. And it has been going on for nine months. So this is when kind of like Sudan started to gain international attention on social media. And a lot of Sudanese activists and, you know, pages are continuously reporting on Sudan, like every single day, tirelessly. But most of our voices do not really reach level, like higher levels. It's usually just us on Twitter talking to other people, random people. We are speaking with Omiya Mustafa, whose name on social media is Zaira, and we'll have a link to your Instagram account at talkworldradio.org. And if you can send me any other accounts, uh, social media pages we should link to, I can put them there. Um, yeah. it, it, it seems like to me, Omiya, that probably 100% of the weaponry is coming from outside. I don't know how much weaponry of war is manufactured in Sudan or in all of Africa. We, we hear about, oh, there's another war in Africa. Nobody ever talks about where the weapons come from, do they? A lot of people fail to realize that most of the superpowers economies literally depend on weapon industry. It depends on weapon trade. If there is no war, there's no money the capitalist world is going to collapse. So for this system to continue, the cycle has to continue, you know. And what is a better place to destabilize the, than the Africa, you know, because you're selling weapons and you're getting money and at the same time you're getting resources. So why not just do everything in Africa, right? Like it's the, <laughs> it's the easiest market because people are like, they 
they are very corrupt so and they hate each other and there's like a lot of internal conflicts and the, the there are many resources so why not just africa basically but i think sudan sudan weapon industry it was good because um there is a lot of weaponry manufactured in sudan i would say i'm not really sure but up until the 90s um sudan used to import weaponry but then sudan got sanctioned by the use by the usa for basically providing hamas with weaponry so we were unable to you know trade weapons anymore this is when so the government started to manufacture weapons locally with the aid of russia and you know uh, every west enemy basically but most of the rsf's weaponry definitely comes from the uae and some israeli weaponry was also seen with them like some of their rocket launchers and anti aircrafts they were manufactured in israel and a lot of people don't know are they you know together or did they just buy it or are they aiding them you know and actively helping them so yeah a lot of questions uh, quite a mixture of uh, of allies on both sides um like i said what what can people do who want to help what what should people be advocating for or or doing or sharing uh to to educate and to move the world to not make it worse but to help boycott the uae stop vacationing in dubai that's i would say that's the number one demand that most sudanese people can agree on is everyone like i don't know if you've seen the news recently but do you know michael moore like the american rapper yes he he was he was supposed to have a concert in dubai but uh, my other sudanese activists my friends and me they started this campaign which is called the defund the uae and it fall it fell into his ears and he heard about it and he contacted my friend who's a very prominent activist and he asked her like why uh like what's going on like can you give me more details and she was talking back and forth with him about it and eventually he canceled his concert and he published a, a very powerful statement talking about the uae's involvement in sudan and a lot of people like to downplay the importance of like big personalities speaking about conflicts and you know mixing art with politics but they don't realize how impactful they are because right after that statement sudan went trending and everyone was like what's going on in sudan what's going on in sudan and then suddenly everyone knows about it like you know pop pages on on twitter that has nothing to do with politics started posting about it and the comments are learning more and more so i would say the first thing that we demand is to defund the uae to boycott dubai do not buy uh, gold from dubai because that's definitely worth hundreds of thousands of sudanese people's blood like it's not it's not just gold you're you're actively contributing to the massacres and genocides of sudanese people if you keep funding the uae and buying gold from there and i would also like to say maybe raise awareness because because sudan the situation is getting worse in many aspects number one the conflict is still going on and people are still getting genocide and massacred number two the famine which is considered the most horrific and most crushing famine of like the 21st century 2.5 million people were estimated to die by this september just from the famine 2.5 million people that's the population of entire cities by next month yes this statement this uh, statistic came out on may last year and it still didn't make news and then you have the natural disasters the natural disasters are horrifying like the the floods in sudan this this season this fall season is the most a uh, horrific season uh, is the most horrific autumn sudan has ever witnessed since the since like 100 years ago yeah. the floods the you know waterborne diseases 
and there's no healthcare system already. It has collapsed due to the war. So so that the Sudanese people are just enduring like circumstances and situations that most people wouldn't even be able to fathom. Like you're not just uh, dying in a war. You're dying from famine and you're dying from natural disasters and you're dying from epidemics and pandemics of many, many diseases. So uh, Sudan is urgent and it needs urgent help. It needs everyone's attention. It's very much like Gaza, only bigger. Uh, and and there's a lot of food that won't be coming from Ukraine because of the war in Ukraine. Yeah, you used to import a lot of uh, seeds, flour from Ukraine. It used to be our main source. And is that stopped? And are are people are people trying to get out like you've gotten out? And that's a different story. Like that's a, another tragedy on its own. The issues that refugees face in other countries, like have there has been a story going on recently about the uh, like six thousand Sudanese refugees in Ethiopia, yeah, who were stranded in a forest because Ethiopian militias kept on harassing them, and they asked for protection from the government of Ethiopia and from the UNHCR but none of them was, uh, was able to provide them with any help. So they were literally stuck in a, in a forest for months no end with no aid, no shelter, no food, nothing. And every single day, the, like, a lot of like mercenaries and, and militias would come harass them and they would shoot at them and kill like two, three people daily. So eventually they gave up. They walked back to Sudan on foot from Ethiopia to, to Sudan. Those are refugees that need to be protected. And now even in Egypt, like um, like what, two or three months ago, the illegal migrants and the refugees that go from Sudan to Egypt, they would die on the road due to the heat strokes, due to the lack of water, due to the dehydration, like maybe seven or eight entire families died on the deserts. And when they get there, Egypt is launching those like deporting campaigns where they deport refugees, even if they have the card. Yeah. So another wonderful government uh, with Western support there in in Cairo. Uh, Omiya Mustafa, we have about one minute left. Uh, Where can people contact you, follow you, uh, keep up with the news that you're sharing? Uh, they can follow me on Instagram uh, and on X, formerly known as Twitter and TikTok. And they look for Zaira, Z E I R R A. Uh, so on Instagram, it's double Z, Z Z E I R R A. On on TikTok, it's Zaira with a seven at the end. <laughs> and on on Twitter, it's Coshate Dictator. Okay, well, you can explain that one and you can send me the links. And yeah, I'll just send you links. We'll put all the links at talkworldradio.org. Um, Omiya, thanks for everything you're doing. I'm very sorry for what's happened and thank you for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.